Hello hackers! Welcome to Pwn College, I'm Jan and today we're going to talk about control flow in assembly. Alright, so we've learned about registers, we've learned about memory, we've learned about data. Uh, that's great, but, but we can now write a cool program to crunch a bunch of data, but how does it make decisions on whether or not that data is good, that data has been crunched well, etc, etc, etc. Well, we make these decisions using control flow impacting instructions, which we'll talk about here. First, let's look at how a CPU actually executes data. Um, of course, a, uh, sorry, actually executes code. Assembly instructions are in a uh, von Neumann architecture are simply just data. As we talked about, assembly directly translates into binary code, which is then just like spewed into memory when your program is loaded and is then passed directly to the CPU. So somewhere in memory, wherever your program's loaded, in this case at hex 40800, there's a pop REX, and then a pop RBX, and then an add REX RBX, and then a push REX for the result. And this is, is cube in readable form. In reality, it's the binary code. At 40800, there's a hex 58. That's pop RX. That's literally what the bytes translates to. Then there is a pop RBX, that's 5B. Then, and that's at 40801, the memory address. Then there's three bytes because add RAX RBX takes three bytes to encode. Uh, X86 is what is called a variable uh, with instruction set architecture. Uh, in fact, uh, most popular architectures are variable width. I will back that statement up in a second. But uh, x86, depending on the architecture, there's a different amount of bytes that's going to encode, or depending on the instruction, there's a different amount of bytes that's going to encode it. Um, there are some architectures that claim to be fixed width. ARM is one of them. The architecture that is out competing x86 uh, but wouldn't do so in a fair and just world but ARM has plenty of non-standard length uh, instructions realistically every claim that anyone makes about ARM is crap ARM is crap x86 is the best you heard it here first but the TLDR uh, three bytes to this instruction um, oh and the impact of the fact that x86 is a variable with uh, uh, architecture, that becomes much more important later on in future modules uh, in like the blue belt material. But, but right now, this is just how it is. So um, at RAX, RBX, three instructions at 40802, three and four, and then at 40805, uh, three bytes, uh, 40805, one byte, boom. And this is just spewed in memory and then the CPU executes it. Right? And uh, the CPU knows to execute it because RIP, the instruction pointer, is just like pointed here. It has this value and so the next time the CPU runs it'll execute this instruction and then point the pointer to the next instruction and then it repeat. Alright, so what if you want to skip an instruction? Well, you can. You can use jump. Now, this is a bit of a crazy uh, syntax. The, 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 let's say one complex syntax in assembly is jump labels. So this moves CX into 1337. And recall, we're trying to make a little function that we saw in the beginning that just checks some value and sets our leadness to 1337 or zero, depending on if that value is set. Okay. Um, now, we move 137 into a register, uh, CX, the lower 16 bits of RCX, um, and then we jump to this label. We say jump to stay lead. And this basically says, hey, don't execute this. We jump over it. Right? And then the next thing we do is push RX. All right? This is how it's laid out in memory. And this is what it looks like when assembled. I mean, this isn't how it's laid out in memory. This is semantically. Um, how the instructions are laid out sequentially. This is because this jump label is not an instruction actually, it's just a helper to assemble this instruction. These are the bytes that result. 
This is move CX1337. You can in fact see little endian 1337 right here. Cool, huh? And B and 66B9 is move CX. Amazing. Mind blown. All right, this is jump EB. EB is jump. EB04 means hey, skip four bytes and then start executing. All right, boom. We skip this guy, which is move sorry cx0 i don't know why i have rcx here my bad and then we directly execute push rcx this label told us what value to put here but the label doesn't actually get assembled it's just a label for the assembler to use all right um now interesting thing is this jump instruction is kind of cool it is a signed jump this is a signed uh uh, uh byte variable so a value so if it is ff it would jump backwards by one if it's fe it jumps backwards by two and two's complement now what does it mean to jump backwards well if this was jump zero it would not it would add zero to the instruction pointer that's what jump does adds to the instruction pointer the instruction pointer is pointing at the next instruction in this case 40806 this guy if we jump zero, it adds zero to it, just executes the next instruction. I actually, I'm sure it'll work. I I guess it would be a no-op. I don't know, probably have some performance implications. Anyways, uh, if we jump negative one, it'll jump one before the next instruction, which is halfway through this instruction. It'll try to execute 04 as an instruction, which may or may not be an instruction. Probably you're gonna have a bad time. If you jump negative two, EBFE, Memorize that because it's sometimes helpful in debugging assembly code. EBFE jumps back to itself, executes it again, jumps back, and it's an infinite loop. EBFE is an infinite loop in x86. You can write it directly. It's awesome. All right, cool. So that's jump, but that's still not making decisions. That's just skipping no matter what. This will never be executed. It's just skipped. Jump is actually very useful for embedding data in your code. Like you can actually put anything here. You can put bunch of data you can put an image you can put a cat gif and it all work and, and it'll just jump over and keep executing really neat but uh, not useful for making decisions so let's make some decisions when we can do that with a conditional jump right and here we can move some value into CX then we can make a conditional jump to our jump label and keep executing this conditional jump says jump if not zero. And there's a bunch of conditional jumps. There's a jump if equal, jump if not equal, jump if greater than, jump of less than, jump of less than or equal, is a lot of stuff, right? Uh, but what, what are we talking about? What is equal? There's, I mean, this, 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 what, the label? The label is not like, the label is just how far we jump. That's this guy. What is equal? Well, what is equal is the last thing we checked for equality. And this is very interesting about x86 and, and actually many modern uh, architectures. You first check things and then you take actions on these checkings. So it's on, on, on the checked thing. So this actually isn't complete. What we need is to first check something. Um, all right. Now let's talk about conditionals. Uh, conditions. Conditions are kind of crazy. x86 as a whole special register called R flags, right? And then you can't just like move in and out of R flags. Um, it's just a special register. There's other ways, other instructions that can access parts of it and so forth. Um, uh, basically R flags holds a bunch of bits representing condition flags. It just has them. Bit one is some flag, bit two is another flag. and any arithmetic operation, but especially comparison um, operations and test operations, so comp and test, they update all of those flags. And these flags have specific meaning at a very low level. The main conditional flags that are actually checked to implement all of the various conditions that x86 supports is the carry flag, uh, kind of let's say this 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 isn't accurate in all cases but it's a um, useful approximation the carry flag says hey 
in this last operation, this last 64-bit operation, or or 32-bit operation, was the or 8-bit or whatever the the size was the uh, kind of extra bit one was the carry bit one. So if, if in eight bits we added hex ff plus one, that is hex zero zero. That that is a one bit, um, and that is the carry flag. If that would also set the overflow flag. Did the result wrap between negative and positive? So ff 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 is negative in two's complement. You add one, it wraps around to positive. Um, Wait, would that? I wonder if it's set on both directions. I'm not positive about it because you rarely interact with these flags directly. You actually interact with these more semantic uh, type of uh, uh, of jumps that are then taken on those flags. Um, sign flags was the result of the last um, operation negative. Was the that this what is was its leftmost bit the sign bit set or the zero flag was the result zero. So if you wanted to check. If something is equal, for example, here's the last thing, two values are equal, you compare, which does a subtraction, but instead of sub REX RBX, would say REX equals uh, REX minus RBX. Comp REX RBX just does the subtraction, updates the flags, and throws out the result. Um, all right, comp REX RBX, and then jump if equal to stay lead. This will actually check the value and will jump away. Um, test is good for testing for zero. So this test REX, REX, it, it, it ends it against itself. If it's zero, if the result is zero, it'll uh, jump. Or if, it, if the result is not zero, it'll jump, works too. Um, this compares REX against RBX and does a jump if above. That means it's an unsigned comparison. And the awesome thing is the same comparison instruction sets the same flags, but how you interpret those flags will change from unsigned to a signed, from an above to a greater than. Jump of greater, that's a signed comparison. So uh, hex f, 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 f is less than zero because that's negative one. In a jump above, hex f, 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 f is a very large number, unsigned, it's greater than zero. And this is, more or less, for the most part, the only place where signedness actually matters. I mean, there's other cases, of course, but this is the biggest one. Signedness is checked by using the right jump, not even the right comparison, but the right jump for the the uh, the right data type, whether it's signed or unsigned. And you can see the the difference between greater than, which is signed, and above, which is unsigned. Above uh, is checks that the carry flag is zero and the, and the zero flag is zero, where it's greater checks if the zero flag is zero and the sign flag equals the overflow flag. I don't know why that translates to greater than. I mean, you can look it up on the internet and it'll explain it for you. I won't explain it for you. Uh, it's pretty cool that it works. All right. Um, and it's all made possible, this, this simple way where you compare and then it's just the jumps are what matters. That's made possible by two's complement. Awesome, okay. Now that we have conditions and we have conditional jumps, um, we can actually make loops that do stuff. So this is a loop that will count to 10. It sets Rx to zero, it increments it, it compares it against 10, and if it's less than 10, it will jump back. If it's below 10, unsigned less than, it'll jump back to the loop header. When it doesn't jump back to the loop header, it just keeps going forward to the next instruction and now REX is 10. Okay, um, with looping and control flow, we have almost everything we need to write any program. This is exciting. We could write video games, we could write a lot of cool stuff. All we need is one more thing, functions. Modern code is split into functions. You write a function, you call the function. Well, that in the end boils down to call and ret, two instructions. Call saves the place it's at and goes somewhere else. So that ret can return to that place where you called the function. So in a C program, this is a function call. Boom, goes here, executes this, comes back. And this is our checker that we've been implementing this whole um, lecture. Then it calls it again. Boom, goes up there, 
and it knows when it returns and it knows because it saved the address of the next instruction after this call that it'll go back to the this uh, in, in assembly this is what it looks like we first initialize the first argument to zero to check lead here's our function check lead it tests if uh, auth is, the first argument is zero if it is oops that's buggy let me fix that this should be non zero one sec all right now it's correct so this is our function check lead right here say hey is uh, the first argument zero if it is not then we're gonna be lead we're gonna return in RAX 1337 otherwise so it goes here it jumps it executes this otherwise if our uh, RDI the register we're using to pass the first argument is zero we'll move AX which is what the register we're using RAX to pass the return value we're gonna initialize it to zero and then we're gonna return all right when this return happens either of these returns when this call happens we push the address of this guy the next instruction we push the value of our AP onto the stack we go to the function when it returns we pop that value off the stack and we go back and we can keep we go back to the next instruction continue execution so we call check lead with argument zero then we continue going when check lead returns we call it with argument one and then we call exit and boom and uh, we'll talk about how to exit a program in the next video boom how cool is this we have a program in assembly code where we have functions and everything and you just learned it over the course of a couple of lectures Hopefully that was a mind blown thing. Now you might ask, okay, but function calls, you got variable names all over the place. How can I do variable names? Uh, there's probably some macro support in the assembler to do variable names and say, hey, here REX is known as Bob or whatever. Uh, but assembly is so simple. It gives you the variable names. You have 16 variables you can use. RAX, RBX, RCX, RDX, RDI, RSI, RSP, RBP, R8, R9, R10, R11, R12, R13, R14, R15, and RIP to read where you are. How cool is that? You don't have to worry about naming variables. You do have to worry about running out of them. You have to write them to the stack and get them off the stack. Um, but you don't have to worry about them. That's great. Now, you have very few of these register guys, right? So what happens if... Uh, uh, we called the R, we set RDI here and we wanted to keep using it and this function set RDI that would be a bad news well it turns out that there's a contract that pro, uh, functions agree on called the calling convention callee and caller functions agree which arguments are going to be used for uh, which register is going to be used for arguments on AMD 64 which is what we were talking about it's RDI, hey, remember that's what we used for the first argument, that RSI for the second, RDX for the third, RCX for the fourth, R8, R9, um, and then the return value is gonna go into REX, which hey, if you recall, we also used. All right, registers are shared again, so uh, the, the calling convention also needs to define who is responsible for saving data. And it's basically like this, if you call a function, it promises to give you back RBX, RBP, R12, R13, R14, and R15 back in the same state it found it. So if it's going to make changes to those, it'll first save them, usually on the stack, well, on the stack. It'll save them on the stack, push them all. Then it'll modify them, use them however it needs, and before returning, it'll pop them all off. Everything else is up for grabs. Of course, it's except RSP, RSP, you're, you're all using the same stack for these temporary storages of things, so it's going to be maintained. Um, everything else is up for grabs. If you don't want um, RCX to be destroyed by a function you call, save it onto the stack. Just push it. Then pop it after you call the function. That's called caller saved registers. And that is how control flow 
works in x86. And now you can actually write a simple program except for this nagging question, how do you quit? We called this exit function a couple slides ago and I just had question marks. Well, tune into the next video and you'll find out.